Okay, this is this is what I've been trying to. I, I have been thinking about doing for a long time. It's a uh, uh, explanation video. All right. Uh, first of all, just a uh, I don't know how long I have my YouTube channel for a while. I don't know since 2000 whatever. I don't know a long time. Uh, but um, but I just started uh, when I got to Alice here in the Eastern Cape, 2014. I started a series. Uh, I think it was 2014 that I started. Whenever it was, yeah, I think it's 2014. But the whole with the Lombay's passing, whatever have you. I saw these uh, things at the, at the library. Anyway, so I just was just commentary, just talking about stuff that uh, that would happen to this guy, uh, Brother Billy, in the library uh, down in the postgraduate section. Uh, and then uh, then then he retired, and I moved to the, the, my office and did some commentaries. And then then I started to realize after doing all these commentaries, a lot of stuff that I was doing was related to whatever was happening in my life, and also sometimes in my history. And then I would try to you know sort of make it make sense, right? And then about a year ago, uh, less than a year ago, well, more than a year ago, a year some odd ago, um, uh, I've been listening to Yvette for a while, uh, and. Uh, so with the ADOS, when she started the ADOS thing, her and, 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 and Antonio uh, Moore started the ADOS thing, I started to say, well, if I'm doing these things on my YouTube channel just to mesh, it's like recording my life, it's almost like a biography or something like that. I would try to say, well, how do, everything relates to me since I'm ADOS, you know, and a uh, 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 descendant of, of chattel slavery, um, American descendant of chattel slavery. Then I realized what I what what I wanted to do because the ADOS movement was so important to me, uh, like when we did when we did the Black Panther and we're kind of the the, the um, Black Panther thing was so important to me because it was a mass kind of uh, consciousness that was happening um, that I had a separate thing for Wakanda that I did separate for Wakanda. But this I started to mesh two together my own life things and this together. So that's so for, for so that's what's been happening for the last I don't know couple of months whatever it's, it's been more than a couple of months. Uh, so that's what's been happening, and I've set myself a, a sort of a demarcation time, like from now until June, not June, to July, July 4th. I say this is when ADOS, you know, people are sniping at us, we got to get, get over it, and they say get our stuff together, da, 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 da. but after you finish sniping, I'd say from July to, to, to the time of the uh, conference in October, is you get really focused on just ADOS business, you know what I mean? Forget the snipers, just ignore everybody else, you know, we have between now and July to do that, to the July 4th, hey, we're going to wrap ourselves in American flag, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then from, from July to August, you can concentrate on just what's going to happen at the conference for people that's going to go, or just, just in your consciousness, wherever you are in, in, in the world. If you're ADOS, you should be thinking, or an ally of ADOS, you should be thinking about things that would help our, uh, help, help our cause, help, help, help the cause for reparations, which I find is not just money, but other things. Okay, let's see what tea I got. Oh, it's hot. Ooh, I made the tea this morning. It's uh, black currant and uh, robos, and also some tea bag from yesterday. That I forgot which one it was. You know, I made the tea. My wife, who was giggling in bed because she claimed she's sick, I had to make the tea. Give her a cup of tea. Da da. Thank you, Daddy. It's so sweet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, so 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 that's the thing. So I'm, I'm clearing up certain certain things right now. But I want, but to say I want to get to for for a while. It's going to end up a, a, a sort of a semi-political thing. But this I have to say this other stuff first. So bear with me. It's probably going to be long. Sorry. Uh, first of all, I was looking at uh, uh, my whole thing here, and there's a there's a resume thing in in here uh, for me. Uh, and my resume starts and doesn't start, but yeah, it starts a long time ago. My resume starts basically 1970 or whatever, it doesn't matter. But I was looking at the the uh, grants and awards sections. Um, I only listed one, two, three, four, five, six awards, and this has all to do with um, with audio drama. Okay, this is like an audio drama resume. And in 1993, I won the National Federation of Community Broadcasters Award, as I'm going backwards, um, uh, an award from them. Um, I guess that's money. These are all money, money kinds of things. 1991, the Paul Robeson Fund. By the way, Paul Robeson, Superman, a Superman. I did talk about if there's somebody should be on a coin or whatever, Paul Robeson's the one. I mean, like a, a, a reparation. A reparations coin, we should have Paul Robeson, you know, because he brought the whole thing to the UN, which is the wrong venue, but, you know, we got it right. You see, we keep on adjusting until we get it right. Um, 
1990 National Endowment for the Arts, 1989 National Endowment for the Arts, 1988 New York State Council of the Arts. But here's the two, 1990, 1989 National Endowment for the Arts. These were individual awards. At the time, uh, they were given, I got $10,000 each. And at the time, it was uh, the highest an individual could get for an artistic project. I think that's what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. But how did I get this award? Let's go back. Now, I'm, I'm going to get back to this. But let, 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 let's go back, okay, in time. And uh, another um, thing I, I mentioned. I mentioned that um, uh, I was at the 1988 Democratic Convention in, in Atlanta. Uh, now, I get, came there on my own tip or whatever have you. But the thing is, it was upheaval at the station. It was this whole, this whole thing. And I was like, I won't say not persona non grata because I was an engineer, so I was very essential to the, to the station, whatever have you. But um, I was visiting a friend in Atlanta, uh, 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 John Harris Jr., my theater partner. Man, John, oh man, I love that. John, we built a theater one time together. Me, John, Big John, this other carpenter, we built a theater on 13th Street, down there on, on the Avenue A, it's, it's upstairs. Theater, we call it Theater of the Streets. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, uh, anyway, uh, what, what I was getting at is that in, in that thing, when I came down, uh, when I came, they had a group all together, and I was in the group, right? And there's a Pacifica, they, they just national, they brought all these big, just flew them in, put them up in hotels, whatever have you, whatever they did with them, right? And not, not, a, lot of, not a lot of people on this national staff knew me, but you know, the, the two people who actually didn't know me, they were like enemies. I didn't say enemies, but you know. So they, what are we going to do? So I'm here, I can help out. So what, well, why don't you go do, do some Vox Pop, you know, uh, popular voices. You go out and get interviews with people. And I, at the time, well, even now, I'm really good at that. I mean, if I, um, that's what I started out with, WBAI, really, uh, if you want to put, even before then, with Variations of Blackness, my radio program. But uh, I started with Emanations with, uh, with Bernard White. And why would I do? Well, we, we, we'd have a subject for the, for the, it's a weekly program. We have a subject for the night, it came on Sunday nights. And uh, and so so I would go out and get sound on that subject, you know, say tape the subject was reparations. And I would go, we was right there, close to the pub, close to the uh, post office and the, and, the, and the Madison Square Garden, you know, the train station, all that stuff. So there's a lot of different kind of people. So I always would get some vox pop and, and vary them together. And then the, the the thing about vox pop is what you do is you isolate the voices. So I don't have to repeat the question each time. I don't even have something, the way I did, I didn't have to repeat the question. Like I get the, the person who, who, who would repeat the question, I'd put them on first, perhaps somewhere in the beginning. And then each one would basically tell a story without me being in, I cut myself out. But you know, if you heard the Vox Pop, it's only like uh, four minutes, five minutes at the most. And it would just tell a story, maybe only, yeah, about three or, three or five minutes. And it would tell, it would tell, set up this, the, the, the program for the night. So just like if you're talking about reparations, it would be program for the night, so I could you know, talk to people, but they would think about reparations, da da da, I make the thing, okay. So I was quite good at it by the time. Because I started, I started that at BAI in like 82 when I first got there, and this was like, um, this was like the convention was 88, so you know, I had like, whatever, how many years is that, whatever years, that was six years of experience of doing this Vox Pop. That's what I, my specialty. So I went out there, and the first one I got, there was this other, there was this sister was running on another of party. I forgot her name, but she was at the time she was a big, a big deal, and I and I and I got to get her on tape. But she had said something about we're going to kick there, and so instead of saying so, I cut it where it said ass, and I went to a next a next person. But the way the person you can tell, even though the word ass wasn't in there, what she said, right? What happened because of the next one? You he didn't say ass, but but but. You, you you got you got what she said would be censored out, you know what I mean? Because it's a national program, but also it carried on. Okay, so they were very impressed with that. So they said, "Hey, well, now now it's something important to the group." So they sent me out. So day after day, it was some three or four days. There, there, the, the last day for some. Oh, I had to get back to New York, and so I was leaving early before and they already said. Um, but the caucus, the caucus was the guy, and blah blah blah, and that was announced. Um, and so I put in my last box pop right before. You know, right before all this stuff, I put in my last five months with today, and I got in the car with her, because I, was, I had my sister's car at the time. And uh, oh, I was taking Robert Knight home. He was living in South Carolina, North Carolina, I think it's South Carolina, North Carolina, South, wherever he was living in the South. You know, so I, I took, because he's on the way, I took him home. But on the way out, you know, we was listening to the broadcast. Now, in this, in this Vox, but it's finest Vox Pops I did, I was going around to people, but I clearly remember this guy. This guy had said something, I noticed he had a you know, Spanish accent. 
So I went and kept on going. Then I went back to him. I said, look, can you say what you just said? Would you told me a little while in Spanish? I said, sure. So he said it in Spanish. So what I did in the Vox Pop, since it was, yeah, it was such, 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 I left his Spanish thing very short, for what, 15 seconds? Whatever. I left it, and I put it in as part of the Vox Pop, right? Okay, so me and Robert are riding up to New York from, from Atlanta. So we got to, we tuned in, you know, listening to the thing. I'm listening for my boss. My boss come on, and they had cut the Spanish thing out. They had cut that, they went into my edit and cut out that essential thing. Now, look, you have to understand, I'm not a news person. This is, in fact, this is one of the reasons why I don't do news or I don't, I don't like to be edited. When I say I don't like to, don't get me wrong, I can be edited, but you got to you got to negotiate. You know, I guess they didn't have cell, we didn't have cell phones at the time, so maybe it wasn't maybe I was looking for permission. I doubt it. This was like you know, Pacifica, but white liberals, you know. Anyway, so they cut it out. I was highly upset. Now here's the trick that had played before Dukakis made his acceptance speech or whatever it was. In his acceptance speech, nobody knew this. Not in not. Nobody knew, but in his acceptance speech, he spilled a whole section in Spanish. He delivered it in Spanish. So if we, if they would have did what I what I handed in, then we would have had a scoop. In other words, we would have gave a little Spanish thing in our thing before he gave his speech. So he, you know, he is simpatico. This is how. This is why I'm in the arts and I'm not in whatever this other. Because pe when people think too literally, whatever happened, uh -uh. I'm connected with, with the literal stuff and I'm connected with the spirit. You know what I mean? With the spirit, I'm connected. I'm, te I'm connected. I'm telling you. All right. My life says I'm connected. So I was highly upset. And I, I mean, I got back. I find, 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 I, well, I cursed them out to. Heck to high water, I cursed them out, you know what I mean? And they knew they they knew they knew messed up, okay? The person, was like, okay, I give you all that to say, this was 1988. Now, if you notice in this thing, I got this award, the first National Endowment was in 1989, okay? And this, uh, um, yes, yeah, 1989. Um, that's when I got the award, but I think I didn't do the production until 1990. Doesn't matter, I never did the production. And that, that's a whole story. I'll tell that some other time. I'll, it was, let me put that, It was a post-production grant. I was at a conference. I was at an audio drama conference, and I didn't get, get to participate because I was doing this thing for Norman Giles in his group, and they were all we were like dedicated. Da da da. So the last night comes, and, and I get to play my little sample of what, what of my thing. In fact, I played. It was uh, we was doing the Long Dream. I played a sample of Long Dream, and a guy there, uh, Tom, I forgot his last name, I mean, a big time thing. He said, Oh, that's really good. Too bad, you know, you know, the National Endowment of Arts, they have post production grants. You can go for post production. This was like three days before the due date. I said, What? Because there was always in some place, I forget where, some other state. So I went home, and I just knocked this out, you know what I mean? And I got the post production grant. It's $10,000. $10,000. Okay. So. So I had done that one, so this is 1988, coming back for the thing. Oh, this is for the long dream. Okay, another reason why I was getting back uh, in 1988 uh, is because I was working on the long dream. I was adapting it and stuff like that. And I was, I, my cast was ready, and I had to get back for rehearsals, but I had one last thing to do. And in fact, I met Bernard up in New York, and he had this, somebody lend him a little place up in the Catskills. So we, we went up there together, you know, in a little cottage, or whatever, in several rooms, you know what I mean? So me, me finishing the play. And so in finishing the play, I said, I say, you know, Bernard, I got a role for you. I think you can, you can do this, this is Preacher. He said, okay, I'll take, I'll take a look at it, right? Now, we, have, we was having rehearsals in a couple of days, something like that. So, um, so I gave him the script, gave him his part, when I gave him the script, so we go to rehearsal, okay. And now you should know this. Um, the reason why, even though I came to the station in 1982, and I didn't start my audio drama really until 1989, somewhere 88, 89, with my group, Creative Unity, I have a small, I had a core group. Now, so, you know, the thing that made, uh, was that Orson Welles so good? It's because he had a core, he had a theater group, a core theater group, the Mercury Theater Place. You know, they did the audio radio dramas, and then when he went, when he went to Hollywood, he kept that such sort of that, that core group of people. So if you're going to do anything successful, you have to have a core group of people that's dedicated to what you're doing. And you don't have to, you don't have, that you have to have a core people that you're working with, which is why ADUS is so important. We have a core group of people we don't know yet, but you know, we're virtual right now. We're getting, we're getting it right when the conference comes. Okay. So we had a, 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 a very rare for me, but but we usually with audio dramas, I just have really one run through, a read through, if you will, if you will. We really have, we don't have rehearsals, okay? 
In fact, I won't get into that. I've got a lot of adventures with that. So we have we had rehearsal. I remember all my people have been with me for a while. Bernard had never been in an audio drama that I'd done. So he was reading it there. And then afterwards, it's like it was like a really flat reading. And I'm, I know, this thing like, audio drama, I have faith. I don't worry. I've never had a bad audio drama. Well, no, I've never, I've never had successful audio dramas, let's put it that way. So afterwards, you know, Bernard went home, whatever, and I was talking to the, the, I was with the crew, and you could tell they was going like, I don't think this thing is going to work. This guy, you know, Bernard may be good, a good radio voice or whatever have you, but he ain't handling this role right. And I'm a, I'm a, okay, I know direction. I, I know what to do with actors or whatever. I'm just, this is one of my things. Okay, later on that night, Bernard called me up. He says, Anthony, I got it. I said, click. That's all he had to say to me. Anthony, I got it. As soon as he said that, I was, I was, was per per because of point there. Okay, here's what it was. This was really amazing. He affected a southern, uh, you know, one of those southern singing preachers, you know. And uh and the Lord said uh, da, 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 and it would do da, 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 that whole that whole cadence, you know. So he had done that for this character. And it was so good. It was so good. Because remember, we didn't have rehearsals. The cast didn't know. And, the, and what he was doing is because there's a funeral. It was about a funeral. It was, it was this, this thing that happened with the uh, the long dream go around. This this fire. It, actually, real fire that happened in the Midwest. And, and it's, uh, uh, Richard, it's, it's a Richard Wright book. And so, so we adapted to that. And then there was this big fire. In fact, that was amazing too. At the, at the same time, they had that the, the, the Happy Land fire in the Bronx. Have, at the same time, we was we was in the midst of put of putting on this thing to was mirrored what we were happening, what was happening in a, in, in an audio drama. Hey, I'm telling you, I'm connected. So it was this fire, whatever. So this was a preacher that was doing the eulogy for all these people that died in this fire, right? So and it was the South, so he did this whole Southern thing, and it was amazing. I mean, Bernard had us going. It was like a real preacher. I mean, you can feel. I mean, I was. I can. How can I explain it? Like, say if the. Um, we have, uh, you have the 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 the, uh, the control room. I, I was in control room B. Okay, control the main, main control room. We, we put the power over to control room B. Can I go from there? I was with, with, with my other engineers. I think uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if I don't think. Yeah, I think that um, Daryl, my regular engineer, was there, and I think that Jay Smooth just came on board. I just threw him in there. I threw him in there. Just threw him in there. Anyway. So Bernard had, so all of the whole cast was in this other room doing this funeral then. That's when Joe Masseri had this, the, the fits, the, the, the binaural, you know, head for, for the microphone. We have all kinds of things that happen to us. Anyway, see, so he's part of them. So they're doing this funeral service, and, 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 and people going, ah, and they're falling out, whatever happened. But then I couldn't stop it. I mean, the things you could tell people were, like, into it. And we had to, I'm gone, gone. So I had to run out of there, run into the uh, control room, and I had to hum the people out. You know what I mean? They were doing it. They were doing it. I said, hum, and just just hum the people out because they can't see. They can see me behind the glass. They wouldn't know what I was talking about. So I had to go there and just hum the people down to get that energy out. And then luckily we went to another room because with the way I have wired the station, you know, where I go to different rooms uh, to do audio, different scenes in audio drama. It's, it's like seeing a play, you watch a play, you see the different rooms, but instead of putting lights up, I put up microphones up in different rooms, so it, luckily it went to another room. Whew, man, it was exhausting. Went back, let up. Okay, it was a great, great, great successful thing or whatever happened. Okay, so out of the strength of that, I don't even think I put in a report. I was putting, again, I put in for National Endowment for Arts before a regular, not just post-production, but before a, a regular program. Now, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm saying. Here's what's interesting. Here's my, I think this is, I know this is what happened. The guy that did, that did me wrong at the, that did me wrong, that did the piece wrong that I did, Fox Box that I did at the at Democratic National Convention in Atlanta in 1988, the guy, the, the Pacifica crew guy, the guy, the head guy there, that really, had, maybe he's the one that cut it out. He happened to be sitting on the, but this is all radio, because in the National Endowment for the Arts, you know, you, you, the people who sit on your panel are people that's in your field, so you can't, you know, you can't BS them, or so whatever happened. So he knew he did wrong. When he saw my name, he basically put me in for National Endowment for the Arts. You see how this works? So you never know how things could happen. So anyway, so with that, with that second money, because I, you know, because I always pay people. I don't, I don't take nothing. When myself, oh yeah, this is the. Oh by the way, here, 
I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, my first business card um, for BAF, for business card for audio drama. And you see, that's a that's a picture of my my hand and my the first headphones I had. And this guy, um, uh, a Gilbert Giles, great artist, part of Creative Unity when we first started, he did that for me. And I really like that. Oh, is that? It's, it's a beautiful rendition of my hands on the, on the, on the headset. Well, audio. It just says audio there. Okay. Now, I bring all that up because of the, 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 so that person, I, the thing I did for the long dream, that was more or less a graduation present to, to the uh, Creative Unity because uh, at that particular point, we were down to like, um, we were four main people in Creative Unity. Uh, Rodney Dower, Yusuf, and Michael. There's four man people, and the, the 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 long dream is about four kids coming of age. So they played the parts. It was really a great production. Okay, then I went to production that uh, I guess I, I guess I'm famous for it. Nobody knows it, but uh, um, people do know. This is before I became an director. This is a play. It's called Richard Rice. It's called The Outsider. Okay, the outsider. Now, the outsider. What I did. The outsider was um, was Richard Rice reworking of Native Son. Okay, Native Son at bigger time. I said, well, Cross Damon, the protagonist for the outsider, is like as one uh, Henry F. Winslow Jr. wrote as a review when it, when Outsider first came out in the fifties. He wrote, and I met Henry F. Winslow Jr. Hey, I shook his hand. And he was a good guy. He lived over there uh, by back in Lincoln Center, you know, where the lonely smoke in the morning. She lived in that, that area. It was what they called Spanish Hill before the, 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 the urban new, renewal, whatever they called it. They, they knocked out, they knocked all the black people and, 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 and poor people and Latino people out of that area to build Lincoln Center and, you know, I was, all the places over there. Anyway, but what I did was I took The Outsider, which is a huge book, my favorite book. Uh, and, and again, I say this all the time. If you are a school teacher and you're teaching Native Son, you know, in fact, I think they're making a new thing of Native Son. The outside is the book, okay? Because when, when Richard Wright wrote Native Son, he purposely wrote it as a two-dimensional character. People don't realize he wrote it as a two-dimensional character on purpose because he didn't want it, he didn't want to, to, to glorify or, or, or have any, any sympathy for, for Bigger Thomas. Because for me, it's just Stone Cold Killer. But in Cross Damon, in the outside, he basically made a three-dimensional bigger Thomas. Really amazing. But also his first, that was, but, but, but what I did, the book that he wrote before, I think, I don't think it was, it wasn't published, before uh, he became as famous because I think um, uh, Native Son was his second book, right? But that's the one that went to the National Book Club and whatever, the, 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 whatever that thing, it was a huge thing. He was the first black person on the thing and it was a whole thing, he was, it was amazing. Um, in fact, it's, it sent America into tizzies or whatever, because I was living, uh, at one point I was living in uh, Princeton, New Jersey on Lee Street. It's the same street that Paul Robeson lived on. Uh, when he was, of course he was born, he was raised in Princeton. Um, anyway, uh, um, I, was, I was living with these old, old, old couple, you know what I mean? They, 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 and their backstory was they, they were the butler and the maid, no, the driver, and the maid, but the driver, yeah, and the maid for this rich white couple, and they were retired. And I was living in their house, a little room in their house, because I was uh, a lab technician at the medical, the Princeton Medical Center, which back then was Princeton Hospital. Anyway, uh, and they told me, I, and I asked them about the outsider one time about Richard Wright, and they said, "Oh yeah, that that book when they when that came out, you know, the madam and uh, and, uh, and the mister, they they come down, they ask, is this true? Because they're reading it, out, you know, this white people are reading something into black men. Is this true? Is true? They answer them. It was interesting to me because they have here's this black couple, you know, servants for these rich white people, and they knew nothing about black life. I'm talking about the, the, the rich white people, and uh, so I don't know." Anyway, so I just want to say it was a sensation when it came out. But Law Today was the, was a book that he wrote before he wrote uh, Native Son. So what I did is I uh, took Law Today and uh, and The Outsider and I made it into one huge play. <laughs> huge. When I say huge, this ended up, it was, see, it's supposed to start at 8.30. It says 8.30 p.m. and go to 3.30 a.m. It went beyond that. I think it went to, yeah, it went to like 5.30 or something like that. And it was like something like nine and a half hours of live audio drama, no commercial breaks. You hear me? No commercial. Even when we had a rebroadcast of news at 11 o'clock, what we did is we, we took a Yusef, who, we took Yusef, who does a lot of voices, and, and in Law Today, there's this uh, uh, radio thing happening. 
So we took the news, the regular news of today, whenever it was 1990, whenever it was 1991, whenever I did that. Um, uh, uh, we took that regular thing, right, and we, we, you know how the news has the people that introduce the news, the, pre the presenters that introduce the, the news clips. Well, we had, we took the, the, the anchors out, all right, the presenters out, and put Yusef in, and Yusef affected the voice of somebody of the 1950s. It was amazing. So in that break, that news rebroadcast break, we had altered it. And so it was a news of the day, but it was delivered in this style. So basically from... From the time the piece started, 8.30, all the way through, you had you was in this world of basically the 1950s, okay? The entire, the, even the news. It's amazing. It was an amazing feat, actually. Uh, so, they said, wow, but who would, I have to tell you the story, or I gotta tell you the story. So, who in the world would sit down and listen to an audio drama all night long? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. For see, here's the thing about me and for, I look at circumstances. If I can get away with it, I shouldn't say, if I could do it, I'd do it. So in this thing, I'm going like, B.A.I., I can do a long audio drama. I'm going to do a non-commercial audio drama. No sponsors, no nothing like that, because the people are the sponsors, right? So somebody, so one this, 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 and B.A.I. listeners were, back that time was amazing, because, you know, they would leave their radio on all the time with B.A.I., even when they went to sleep with the dead air, it doesn't matter. They, they would have B.A.I. on all the time. Well, she's, this sister came to me and said, Anthony, I'm mad at you. I said, well, well I, do, I sister, I ain't do nothing to you. I, I, no, 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 you're, you're, you're the reason. You know, I was, I was pursuing this guy for a long time. He would never listen to BAI. So I finally had him over to my house, and I was cooking dinner, you know. And then you know, the radio was on, so I was, I was making the, the thing. And every once in a while, I tried to make conversation with him, and he would, he, I noticed he was quiet. And then I look at it, and he's listening to the, to the audio drama. He listening, he's listening to your radio drama. And, and, and in fact, he was shush me a couple of times to listen to this, to, to this radio drama. And he said, he says, no, I've been pursuing this guy, and you, and, and so we had to sit up the whole time, we listened to your, 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 your radio drama. I said, well, sister, blah, blah, blah. So it's interesting because people would say, why well, are you crazy? Nobody's gonna sit down and listen to that long, but somebody, obviously some people do or did. So again, that's for me to find that out, to validate what I see. What I'm saying I'm hooked up. I'm telling you, I'm hooked up. But this was actually an amazing experience because it was so long. In fact, we had let me see. Here's the cast. Huge cast. On the cast, as you you see, like for instance, you know, original song by Nadine Shaw, Anthony Sloan, and, and James Spaulding. You know, oh Vince Williams and James Spaulding. V Vince, Vince Williams was my roommate at the time. He, he was a big time soap opera, soap opera star. He he, he passed. My, he big time soap. Opera. And 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 um, who played who played the saxophone? And, and he came from New Orleans. And um, and and James Small, James Small, James Spaulding, who I who was in my graduating class at Livingston College. You know, they would they had this saxophone back battle because it was the Mr. Blumen or Mr. Bloomer, Mr. Blumen and, and Cross Damon had this uh, argument, uh, basically the communist argument about being a communist party, whatever have you, was took up like, I don't know, how many pages, 20 pages in the book. And so they had this battle in the hallway, you know, and as the, as the, as, uh, as the, uh, as the characters were on thing, I had the background as they, these, these two saxophones battling. And when I came up with that idea, this is when Jake, Jake Glassman, uh, the best, just the best technical director ever was, you know, when I was explaining this to somebody and Jake was there and to myself, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? And, uh, but Jay looked at me and said, he has a really dry humor. He says, how'd you come up with that bright idea? Anyway, so we did it. So we did it. I'm sorry, I had to go off on all this stuff. But my point is, oh, also, to show you how we were going, here, let me show you one of these things. Publicity, graphic, special assistants. Yeah, we had special assistants. Hey, Miguel, what's Miguel doing as special assistant? I guess special assistant. Here, the herbology, elixirs, and performance tonics by Shiree Fitzpatrick. We, have, we even have people, we even have Shiree who have who had tonics and whatever to keep us going. And I'm gonna tell you, after the end of that thing, uh, Kofi Pendergrass was, well, we, we got into his program. In fact, he said, look, I'm not even gonna do my program. Y'all can finish, finish it, finish it, Yo, go finish it. Because I have, we had started New York Post Cafe. When we put that news, that rebroadcast in the news, I brought the cast, the rest of the cast up to the station. So we finished the piece at the station. But when we finished Kofi and his program, I think it was a half hour left on his program. 
he just sat us down, me and Bernard, and just interviewed us, you know, because Bernard was was the narrator. See, we had two narrators. We had, we had the inner, we had Cross Damon, who, who Harold Lucius, you know, really great, another great radio voice, who was my intern at the time, and uh, and and as as the voice. But you know how you when you're talking, you hear yourself from your inner voice. So as the inner voice, I had Bernard play the inner voice. Basically, those are you two narrators. Well, Bernard's really the narrator, but but uh, well, yes, Bernard's the narrator. And so and, and, and so 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 Bernard. Anyway, me and Bernard were were, were interviewed by by, by Kofi Pentagraph at the um, at the end of the thing. And then when we finished, you know, we we, we just left. We just said, okay, go home, go home. We went both different ways. But I'm telling you, I was. Um, you have Penn Station there. Um, uh, it's a train station. You know, trains coming from New Jersey. Basically coming from New Jersey, <laughs> um, and uh, and also you can catch the regular the the the, uh, the, the subway the, the subway lines you know the 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 F, the, 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 uh, uh, the A train C train uh, uh, oh uh, eight one two three trains whatever a few blocks of area. Well, this is like six o'clock in the morning, We're, and I'm I'm just I was so hyped, I was I was. Basically, just walking in a daze around, you know, Penn Station, and I ran into Bernard, who also, also was in a daze. The, the energy from doing all this thing was so much. It was so. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. It was um, it was you, you, it was humming. You was my whole body was humming from this experience. You know, and we just we just went to a bar, and just sat down. <laughs> I don't know if we drank. We just it was an amazing experience. Okay, now I bring all that up. Just to say, when I first got the uh, when, when I when I won when I won when I when I got that um, oh, this goes back in here I'll put it here outside so you'll see outside because I am the outsider actually can that stay up there hey hold up there for the outside yeah Nova Radio Production. Uh, but when, when, when I won those other, oh, uh, was it in here? I know it is. Um, in 19, when I won that first award, and it was 1989, whatever have you, the National Endowment for Arts, I got to remember, you have two senators in your state. My two senators at the time were Al D'Amato, the Republican, and, um, and uh, I always blank on his name because I, I so about the DP, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Daniel Patrick Moynihan has done more a damage to the black community than people realize because it was his paper. And remember, he's a, he's the immigrant. He's an immigrant. And he comes in, instead of talking about his Irish industry, he does his 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 thesis on on the black family, or he does his book on the black family. It's academic work, and that's what got rid of this whole welfare. So under I think it was under, under Lyndon Johnson. I always think it's, it, it was it was Kennedy, but it was under Lyndon Johnson '65, I guess it was that this other book came out. But he was noted for this whole thing, and they had put into place. Remember, this is academia informing the political process, which is how we get to ADOS right now. And he wrote this paper that basically, basically said black, black men need to get out of the, out of the house because they're whatever. It destroyed the black family. This was the this was the academic and political thing that destroyed the black family. And to me, he was the to me he's one of the greatest enemies. Uh, yeah, you know, um, that just this, this thing on, on um, that John, um, uh, Johnson, the, the one that that, uh, that that with Lincoln and uh, uh, that was president after Lincoln. He's the one to put the black codes in and. To whatever they have you, he was he, so he was a bad president. You of course you have Coolidge who basically res resurrected the Ku Klux Klan and gave them glory. So he's a bad and, and, and put desegregation in, in into the government into the into the White House into the government. So he's a, a bad guy. But to me, for my lifetime, it's Daniel Patrick Moynihan because destruction of the black family, that community, that's what did it. That's what did it. And so I, I anyway, let me go back to the, so that first year. Uh, I get a letter from Al D'Amato's office, you know, congratulating him on, on my grant. Nothing from Daniel Patrick Monaghan's office. This is the difference. This is where you have service delivery and politicians. Because he knew, or his staff knew enough to, in fact, what, what did they do? And congratulate one of their constituents, you know what I mean, on, on an award. The next year, when I won the second one, that's when I got a letter also from Daniel Patrick Monaghan. So basically, so, so basically we have two... What I'm trying to say, we well, uh, we have two two senators, and I got I got letters letter, letters from them. That's it. So that, that's the story. So what I'm trying to say, academia, 
informs the politicians and also is supposed to inform that the press is supposed to take that stuff to academia and, and give it to the people. So so as 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 the politicians are getting information from academia, the, uh, the, the press is actually giving that information to the uh, to the uh, to the people. And then what we're supposed to do. Uh, then, then basically what, what, what you do is they, they carry out these, these, these kind of things. So for me, the importance of ADUS right now is that, yeah, uh, and Antonio and, and, and Yvette are doing their thing. We got Sandy Darity and, and, and Derek Hamilton also in academia. So we have those two things happening right now. Now we got to get our politicians to listen to not only Yvette, who gives us, Yvette and, and Antonio, who gives us our marching orders for, for ADUS, uh, uh, American Design of uh, Child Slavery, but also we got to make sure that uh, academics get, get, get to influence those policy makers. So when they have these committees, I think now Bernie Sanders wants to do a committee or um, I don't know what, what uh, Booker is supposed to be putting in some legislation. We've got to see what that looks like. But now we got to go through all that stuff and now we got to do some, some real work. Okay, so that's where we are right now. Sorry to be here so long, but I had to tell you all that to tell you that you never can tell because the reason why I got that, those grants is because somebody done did me wrong. Somebody done did black people wrong and you, you just got to persevere because when, when they did us wrong but it's going to come right you have to believe this is we're connected ADOS is connected that's what I need to tell you me T from the past let's take the train to Tibet let you know what I only suspect from a desk of the ADOS American descendants of chattel slavery hey Dolly you're out of bed can, can you turn that off for me please baby Certainly, yes. Yeah, thank you.